Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Advances in Laboratory Freeze-Drying, presented by Kelly Williams and Jenny Sprung. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by LabConco. Serving the scientific community since 1925, LabConco manufactures laboratory equipment, specializing in ventilation products such as chemical fume hoods and biological safety cabinets. They also produce other equipment, such as glassware washers and freeze dryers for the lab. LabConco has ISO 9001 certification, one measure of the company's commitment to quality and consistency in design and manufacturing. LabConco equipment is manufactured in Kansas City, Missouri and Fort Scott, Kansas, and marketed worldwide to academic, industrial, life science, pharmaceutical, environmental, forensic, and clinical laboratories. To learn more about LabConco, please visit www.labconco.com. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want and any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice you'll be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. Finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or you can use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Thank you. Before we meet the speakers, a poll question will appear on your screen. You may select an answer or close the poll question by clicking on the X in the right corner. Thank you. And the question is, are you currently lyophilizing, freeze drying in your laboratory? Please take a moment to, to answer. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Kelly Williams is a product manager for freeze dryers and evaporators at LabConco. She has helped LabConco customers with their application and equipment needs for more than 17 years. Kelly has a BA in biology and an MBA in marketing. Prior to working with LabConco, Kelly conducted endocrinology research in a biochemistry lab. Jenny Sprung is a Senior Application Specialist at LabConco with emphasis on evaporation and lyophilization, glassware washers, water, and forensic products. She also covers all of LabConco's 17 product lines. Jenny has a BS in Biology with a minor in Chemistry. Prior to working at LabConco, she worked at SC Johnson Wax in Sensory Marketing. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Williams. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Judy. Um, thank you for joining us today. We are going to um, speak specifically on laboratory freeze drying and um, the advances that are happening in laboratory freeze drying. But as we go over the process in general, how to develop a protocol, deal with challenging samples, and also troubleshooting. So this will give you a really good um, background on an overview on freeze drying and what is, is, it has been happening. Also in the presentation, we'll go over some definitions. If you're not really familiar with freeze drying, there, there is terminology specific to the application, and it, it, it's nice to understand that. So many people wonder, is freeze drying, what's the difference between freeze drying and lyophilization? And there really isn't a difference. They're the same process. And this process um, is, um, is undergoes what a condition called sublimation. And in sublimation, that is simply where your solvent, such as water or can be other solvents, pass directly from a solid to the vapor state. And that is what makes um, freeze drying very unique compared to evaporation or other processes. And we'll go over what is required to actually sublimate and the type of equipment that is needed and some of the advances that are helping speed the sublimation rate and also give more consistency and quality to the whole freeze drying um, process. But in general, freeze drying and lyophilization, the exact same thing. Lots of times lyophilization is more of a scientific application 
where freeze drying can be more for food or that type of stuff, but they're used interchangeably. When we are talking about sublimation, this rate of sublimation, in other words, how fast the freeze drying is, is occurring, is dependent on temperature and pressure. And if you can look at this chart, um, this is a, a great chart to show the difference um, in, in between freeze drying or sublimation and evaporation. In sublimation, we're going straight from a solid to a gas. You do not want to pass through the liquid phase. So um, in evaporation, we're going from a solid or a liquid to a gas. It's more from a liquid to a gas. So you can actually go through three different phases. But the thing that is very critical that keeps um, make sure that there is a difference between the two is what is called the triple point. And at that triple point is the, is the um, highest temperature that a sample can exist at without going through sublimation. So in other words, you want to keep that um, temperature or also the, keep the pressure so that the temperature is there below the triple point to ensure that you're going through sublimation and not evaporation. We're going to go over the lyophilization process. The first thing that the lyophilization process requires is a pre-frozen sample. This is what the first of four items that are required. It's very important that that um, sample is frozen and frozen solid. In laboratories, many times, um, the, the samples are aqueous. However, there could be other solvents involved in, um, or mixed in with the sample. One thing we encourage people to do, if it is possible, for you to get rid of the other solvents before you freeze dry. If it is not possible, then you are going to um, have to address those other solvents and make sure that your freeze dryer is cold enough to accommodate those. The second requirement of a freeze dryer is a collector that is 15 to 20 degrees Celsius colder than the sample freezing point. This is the main um, driver of the freeze drying, and it is critical. So if you are trying to freeze dry a sample that um, has, a, has a lower freezing point and your collector is not cold enough, that is going to be a challenge. So you need that delta, that change of, of that temperature degrees in your collector when freeze drying. Also, if you do have a freeze dryer, lots of times people have freeze dryers in their labs for 25, 30 years, you're going to want to make sure that it, it continues to get to the to the temperatures that it's supposed to be operating at. As they lose gas or over time, they may, um, their temperature of the collectors may start to um, become elevated. And it's critical that you make sure that they um, stay cold. The third requirement of um, freeze drying is a deep vacuum. And you need a deep vacuum with a minimum requirement of 2 times 10 to the minus 3 millibars. There have been advances in vacuum pumps, and we'll, get, um, we'll go um, over that in more detail. But there are several new pumps out that make the maintenance of the pump um, easier and will still reach that deep vacuum that is needed. After years of experience in freeze drying, many times if, if you were to ask Jenny and I, we would probably say the most difficult thing for, for um, people that are freeze drying is to maintain their pumps and to maintain those deep vacuums. The last, the fourth and last thing that is needed for freeze drying is energy in the form of heat. And a lot of people don't realize this because here you have a frozen product and you want it to keep frozen. You want it to stay frozen. However, um, the heat is what is really driving that process. And um, heat is is certainly variable and is going to be determinant of how long your freeze drying process takes and also the quality of, of the final product. The heat input, it, there's a trade-off between speed and quality for some samples. So a lot of this, um, when you're developing a protocol, the heat input can be a lot of trial and error or um, you can do some um, investigation ahead of time to help you get closer to where you need to be as far as the heat input. And we're going to go over um, these four things more in depth as they relate 
um, to freeze drying. Lots of times people think that when they're in the laboratory flask, freeze drying is very common. And so they have a flask sitting out um, attached to their freeze dryer in the lab. And they don't realize that heat is going in from the room, where the room is at 25 degrees C, and heat is indeed going into that sample. So, um, so you are getting heat there. Even though you think it's just a flask sitting there, the heat input is there. Other things that um, to consider in your um, laboratory when you're freeze drying as far as heat to your flask is it um, is your sample um, we we will have end users um, call us because some of their samples are melting back and some of their, their they them are not and they're all on the same drying chamber and they're the same sample but many times um, a sample could be um, overhanging where their vacuum pump is or that's putting out a lot of heat. Or that sample could be um, by a window where it is, it is getting more heat. So um, heat is important, and it is um, affecting even flask freeze drying. Where um, the heat is more controlled and um, visible is when you are um, freeze drying on shelves, particularly temperature controlled shelves. Um, you can, many shelves can be um, cooled as well, so you can pre-freeze on these shelves or heat on the shelves. And there's also um, heated shelves in clear cylinders. So um, the, sh the shelf freeze drying gives you more control over the heat than the flask freeze drying. And you are getting um, all sorts of heat. You're getting conductive, convective, and radiant heat. But the, by far the most common is the conductive, where it's getting, picking up the heat right from the shelf. But certainly there has been um, investigation into conductive heat and its role in freeze drying, as, as well as radiant heat. But when we talk heat, the most common is the convective, or the conductive. The freeze drying process can be broken down into three, three separate stages. And we'll go through in, in depth these stages. You have your pre-freezing stage, your primary drying stage, and your secondary drying stage. In your, um, all of these stages can be, um, if you are charting your product temperature, can be, during the process, can be identified on um, charts. The first one, your um, freezing, you will notice that um, your um, sample temperature will, um, and if you're looking at the chart, the green um, line is your product temperature, where the blue line is your sample or your your shelf temperature. So your shelf temperature is dropping, and you will notice that um, where the point where the the product temperature equals the shelf temperature is where your freezing is occurring. After you've reached um, your sample is frozen the shelves will begin to um, heat up. However, you will, not no, you will notice there's not a direct correlation there in your product temperature. Your product temperature will certainly lag your, lack your shelf temperature. And, and in that phase where the primary um, temperature or the temperature of your sample is below your shelf temperature because of evaporated cooling, that is where the majority of the water or solvent is removed from your sample. So that is in the primary drying phase, where most of the work of the freeze dryer is being done, and it is certainly the longest phase in the freeze drying process. That primary drying phase um, follows the freezing of it, and will continue until you will notice that your, your product temperature equals your shelf temperature. So for many customers who are not um, going into or interested in long-term storage of their samples, they would pretty much consider um, that the freeze-drying process done after primary drying. For customers that are um, interested or need to get down to very interested in long-term storage or ones that need to get down to very low moisture content in the remaining sample, they will undergo, undergo secondary drying. And it is in um, secondary drying 
where more heat is needed to drive off the bound water molecules. So during primary drying, the water molecules are removed and they are the, molecule, the water molecules in your sample. In secondary trying, the water molecules that are removed are actually bound to your sample and will require a little bit more heat input to break those bonds. Because the, the majority of the water has been, or solvent has been removed, during secondary drying, you can raise the temperature on the sample without um, fear of collapse. Of your or melt back. Collapse and melt back are pretty much um, the same thing. Again, here is a, um, a, a graph of the freezing of your sample. And you can tell um, when freezing occurs for many samples because it will take a dive and then come, the temperature will dive low and then come back just a tiny bit. Some um, terminology that is used in the pre-freezing um, process is the eutectic temperature. It's the temperature when all of the eutectic mixture, both the solvents and the solvents, is frozen. And you're going to want to make sure that your sample is thoroughly frozen before you freeze dry and that it, it does not start melting before you pull your vacuum. You want to get your sample loaded and the vacuum drawn before you, before you start having melt back. For um, if you are freeze drying on shelves and you are not able to, and they are not able to be temperature controlled or cooled, you're going to want to put that shelf in the freezer with your sample. So you want to maintain that sample temperature cold. And, and, and for some systems, it may take several minutes for the vacuum to get pulled down. And once the vacuum is pulled down, you're going to start freeze drying. And you, in the sublimation process, will um, provide evaporated cooling. Your sample will begin to cool, and that's what will keep your sample frozen. So um, if you are freeze drying on shelves and they are not temperature controlled, you will want to freeze that shelf with your sample. There have been some advancements in the pre-freezing um, part of freeze drying, and that's where a lot of the research over the past five to seven years have occurred. And what they are finding is that how you pre-freeze can have an effect certainly on your final product, but it will definitely affect the rate of freeze drying. But how, you, how those crystals are formed and the sizes of the crystals Will, um, will have a, an effect on the rate of sublimation. For many samples, the fastest rate of evaporation or sublimation is going to occur when uh, the, the crystal sizes are large. Large crystal sizes when you're pre-freezing will leave you with a more porous cake, which will allow the, the vapor molecules to leave the sample more easily. When you have um, very small um, pores, the, it's, it's a lot harder for the vapor molecules to leave your sample. So one um, thing that has gotten pretty common in the pre-freezing is a step called annealing. And annealing is the process cycling the product temperature to optimize the large crystal growth for shorter drying times. And not only will annealing um, decrease your drying times, it will also standardize your samples. Believe it or not, when you're pre-freezing and you have a shelf full of samples, for um, you would think, if you're not um, very experienced, you would think that as soon as the, we reached our eutectic point, all our samples would freeze and it, they, it would happen simultaneously. But in actuality, the freezing and the crystallization of the sample is very random. and um, and so you may have one sample freeze way before another one. And so it's, it's a very random process. And annealing will um, standardize that process. And what, um, how you anneal is you simply um, lower the product temperature and then when it, and, and low enough that all your samples freeze and after they're frozen, you would then raise your temperature to a higher temperature for a few hours. And generally, that higher temperature is about three to four degrees below the eutectic point. So you're not raising the temperature high enough for it to melt, 
but you are, um, are raising it to a higher temperature for a few hours, and then you're bringing it back down. And it's pretty amazing how that will standardize the, all the samples to have the, to, to have the very similar crystal sizes as well as sublimation rates or the time required for um, freeze drying. Here's the view of the effects of crystal size. And you can um, see that the larger crystals or the smaller crystals on the left, how it would be harder for vapor molecules to pass through that frozen cake. As your sample um, sublimates or freeze dries, it's going to move through your sample, generally from the top to the bottom. And so as you go into the middle or to the bottom, the molecules to, to um, leave your um, sample have to pass through what's already been freeze dried. So the larger crystal size will leave um, larger pore sizes, and this will um, this can um, be achieved with annealing. When we're talking pre-freezing, a lot of people in laboratories are doing flash freezing. And um, one thing that we highly encourage are um, shell freezing. And you can see the sample there on the right is shell frozen. You can see that um, the sample has been um, turned. And, and here's a picture of the shell freezer. The, the sample has been turned and, um, so that a, the sample has been distributed against the sidewalls in a nice thin coating. Um, other um, suggestions that we suggest are stub freezing. When you um, stub freeze your sample is put at an angle. And both of these have the sole purpose of increasing the surface area. The, the stub freezing on the left is not recommended. That will give you the least amount of surface area that there is, and also may end up in breaking your flask if too much pressure is, is put on that glass in specific spots. So slant freezing to at the very minimum or shelf freezing are recommended. To, um, to just simply decrease the rate of evaporation. One thing that has gotten common um, for freeze drying, if you're, if you're freeze drying a, a highly valuable sample or you're gearing up to freeze dry the same sample over and over, is um, the use of micro microscopy in freeze drying. And there are um, several different um, organizations where you can um, send your sample away and they can actually watch the freeze drying process under a, a, a microscope and they can give you the specific eutectic point and also other temperatures that you should be aware of that are critical in your process. For the majority of people, they have to guesstimate their sample's freezing point. And um, it's pretty easy if you're dealing with a, an aqueous um, solution. However, it can get more complicated if you have more solvents involved. And in those, um, you're going to have to look at the solvents and their freezing point and a look at the percentage of what they are making up of that and get a, good, a pretty good indication of what their freezing point is. Here's a good picture of primary drawing. And I mentioned earlier the evaporative cooling. Even though your sample in a flask is hanging in the room, it is cold and will remain frozen. And that is because of the amount of um, primary drying that is occurring and the molecules that are going. Again, primary drying is where um, the majority of, of, the, of the moisture is removed from the sample. Some some definitions during primary drying are critical collapse temperature. And critical collapse temperature is the maximum temperature that the product can withstand during primary drying without it melting or collapsing. And for some samples, um, they, the critical collapse temperature can be, um, they, if you're using flash freeze drying and it, and it is in a room, um, you may be um, above your critical collapse temperature. And even though you're not controlling that flask, there are ways to um, reduce that temperature of that flask. You can simply um, put a, your sample within a flask, so a flask within a flask, so that you have a um, buffer area 
to um, buffer the heat that's getting to your sample, or you can um, add insulation around your sample. So staying below your critical collapse temperature is important. Um, and also, um, how your sample collapse is sometimes unique um, to your sample. Some samples will undergo a glass transition where instead of all of a sudden melting, the sample is still solid, but it becomes more um, flexible, and that's called the glass transition. So there are some terms for the, the primary drawing. Again, if you do have a sample and it is critical, meaning it's a, it's a sample a pharmaceutical product that's being developed or you're gearing up to go into production and you're going to be running one specific sample, many times it, it is well worth the money to pay to have a study done under a microscope um, to know what your critical temperatures are. Here's an example of um, what they do see under the microscope. And you can see as the um, drawing front is moving across, you have your um, solid line, and that's where the sublimation is occurring. And at the top, uh, I'm looking at the picture on the left, you see frozen material and dried material and a real nice um, solid line that's very visible of the sublimation rate. In the photo on the right, you will see that that line is is not so distinct between the two that there's kind of a, a, a group or a wave behind the sublimation line where your sample is actually collapsing. So um, that is um, what it would look like under a microscope. If you are using a flask and you are in set, um, primary drawing and your sample um, starts to melt, as, as you can see here, um, what is happening is the collector temperature, well, there's many reasons for your sample to start melting, um, but two of, the, two of the most common would be your vacuum level is not um, low enough, or number two, your collector temperature is not cold enough. So um, Jenny will get over or will go over what, um, what we can do to troubleshoot this. But here is the photo of, and in, in this um, collapse or melting during primary drawing is lots of times referred to as meltback. And she will cover exactly how we can control the heat into a flask to prevent meltback. Temperature is important, and um, that is one of the most important things that we have to combat meltback. Here's an example off of a study, and just the, a, a five degree shelf temperature difference can have a drastic effect in, on your um, final product and what, what um, the role of temperature has in the freeze drying process. Vacuum is also another necessity, and by not having the proper um, vacuum, then you um, can also run into problems. Here is um, some visual effects of, of primary drawing, how the role of vacuum and heat determined how the final product ended up. So both of them are very um, critical and can make a big difference in your final product. After um, primary drawing, we go into secondary drawing. And like I mentioned earlier, unless you're doing long-term storage of your product, um, if you're just using freeze drying as a sample prep before analysis, um, for most people, they do not need it. They do not need their sample to be down to um, less than um, five degree or five percent moisture because they're going to re or resuspend it in something else anyway. But for people that are doing long-term storage, it's critical that you go through secondary drying. And in secondary drying, your product looks dry. However, um, you need to um, add heat to that product to, um, to break those bonds, like I mentioned earlier. Endpoint determination is always can be tricky when freeze drying. And um, 
if you're doing long-term storage, you're definitely going to want to know that your product has um, reached endpoint. And again, most, for most um, people, a moisture level between 0.5% and 3% um, ha is what is desirable in order for long-term storage. The ways to determine that you have reached endpoint are visual inspection. You also can measure the condensable gases ver versus a vacuum gauge. And then you also can do product temperature or weight. And these can get very specific. For flash freeze drying, we're going to um, go over a, um, an advancement in a minute of how to determine the endpoint very easily. Long-term storage, if you're going to um, store your sample long-term, you're going to want to stop or under vacuum. And the best ways to do that are to use a drying accessory that will stop or under vacuum. And in addition to the trays that are, are shown here, there are also smaller ones and less expensive samples in order to do long-term storage. Or another um, process is using ampules and flame sealing them. So both of those processes, soppering and flame sealing, will um, seal your sample while it is under vacuum, which is critical. Because as soon as you release the vacuum, you're going to get air in there and it's going to have moisture. Real quickly, um, going over how to pick out a freeze dryer um, in this, and we'll go over some of the advances that have actually happened in the equipment to, to um, accommodate different samples. Your first thing is, like I mentioned earlier, you're going to want to determine your collector temperature. If you have a good idea of what your freezing, t your freezing point of your sample is, then you will um, know exactly what temperature you're going to need to purchase. For most um, manufacturers, there's three temperatures. There's a, a minus 50, which is for aqueous samples, a minus 84, which is for aqueous solvent mixtures, and those are um, higher freezing point solvents, such as acetonitrile. And then there are even um, colder collectors that will get down to minus 105, and those are, are generally if you're using methanols or any alcohols. And when we say using them, we mean dilute. It, it has to be around 5 or 10% or less, and, and, and it will still require the minus 105. So, um, so we, just based on experience, we know if you're using HPLC samples, you're probably going to have some acetonitrile in there. And um, if you're using acetonitrile, you're going to need to use the minus um, 84. If you also have methanol in your sample, you're going to need to use a minus 105. Some other type, common types of laboratory samples are fruits, and they will have sugar, so you're going to need to be concerned about particulates. Soils, you can also need to be concerned about particulates. Um, proteomics, if you're using any acids, you're going to want to take special care of your equi equipment. And, and what, what we have found is for nanoparticles, lots of times they're an aqueous um, sample as well. I've included some eutectic charts and um, for common samples, as well as compatibility with parts of the freeze dryers. So you can see if you're going to need an acrylic lid or a glass lid, and if you're going to need additional um, secondary trapping, and which um, type of vacuum pump. So these are included um, for you to reference. I'm not going to take the time to go through them. Another thing when you're picking out a freeze dryer is you're going to need to determine your collector size. Most um, freeze dryers are labeled by the size of ice capacity. So if it says it's a 2.5 liter freeze dryer, it can hold 2.5 liters of ice before it needs to be defrosted. It, but however, that does not mean you can load two and a half liters of sample on there. A general rule of thumb is you're, you're going to want to put about half the volume of the sample as the ice capacity. So for instance, if you're running a one liter um, sample, if you're going to, and it, not even one liter, it can be one liter spread over 50 samples. But if you add up all the total sample volume that you're loading, you're going to want to times it by two and at least get that large of a collector. So for instance, in this instance, if we are 
putting um, 25, 400 ml samples on, we're going to have about a liter of sample, and we're going to times that by two, and we're going to need at least a two liter um, collector. So our closest fit would be a two and a half liter freeze dryer. When you are um, picking out a freeze dryer, you're also going to want to know what samples are you putting in there, what your solvents are. If you are, you want to check and make sure that what you're putting in there is compatible with stainless steel. If it is not, there are some acids that are not compatible with stainless steel. Then when you're purchasing your freeze dryer, you're going to, going to get a PTFE protection. PTFE is the chemical name for Teflon. So when you're purchasing it is, is when the time you want to get that protection. This cannot be installed later in the field. So if, you, if there is a chance that you're going to be using acids, you're going to want to make sure that you order one um, with that. Other things to consider that we um, run into a lot are um, lots of times a freeze dryer may be a, a piece of core equipment where a whole floor is sharing it. You're going to want to know the needs of everyone that is going to be using it and make the purchase for everyone, or what your, how your science may change in the next year or two. You may not be using acids or solvents right now, but if there's a chance that you're going to use them in the, next, um, in the life of the freeze dryer, it's best to make the purchase with them because there is no going back to make your collector colder or to add that PTFE coating. It's always um, very um, helpful to have a clear path of who's changing, who's in charge of maintenance, who's changing the oil on the vacuum pump. If your oil, if your pump does um, use oil, we um, run into um, core facilities where no one's really in charge of the maintenance, and so the pump gets neglected. And here is a, a, a view of a vacuum, an oil pump that was not maintained. Some things that you can do to make your oil pumps last longer are number one, make sure you're looking at the level and the quality of them. And number two, um, when you're done using a freeze dryer, it is highly recommended to open the gas ballast and run your vacuum pump for at least 30 minutes to purge the oil of any contaminants. And when I talk contaminants, water is a contaminant because um, uh, out of that oil because what does settle into the oil, if you simply shut your freeze dryer off, is just going to sit there and corrode the inside of your pump. So a lot of people don't think that water is that corrosive, but in actuality, for the, the metal in a pump, water can be very corrosive. So you're going to want to make sure that you purge that pump of any contaminants after use. Also know um, your solvents and not just look at the pump and the collector, but also look at the glass and the rubber components and make sure that your sample, um, what you're using, is compatible for those. Um, last or next, you're going to need to pick a drying chamber that's specific. The drying part, drying chambers of freeze dry come in many different um, styles, and they're for tubes or flasks or um, ampules. Here's a new ampule pod that um, can accommodate um, ampules on a drying chamber. You can get bulk tray dryers. You can get clear tray dryers, product shelves, heated product shelves. Um, stoppering, you, it, if you're using stoppering and need long-term storage, you can get a stoppering tray dryer. You also can get a um, a clear stoppering or less expensive ways to stop or smaller samples. Also, you can um, there are equipment if you're stoppering, you can get a, a, a shelf tray dryer. Um, call it, we, this one particular is called our tray dryer, where the condenser and the trays are all in one, and you can do all sorts of different, even flash freeze drying with this unit. Vacuum pumps. When you're um, selecting a vacuum pump, you're going to need to make sure it can um, go to the level, to the deep level that you need. And um, two advancements in vacuum pumps are um, um, a scroll vacuum pump, which is a dry vacuum pump. It does not require oil, or a combination pump. And that's an that's a oil pump that keeps the, the, the oil or the head of the, the pump under vacuum 
which really um, discourages the settlement of samples into the oil. If you're using a hybrid vacuum pump, your maintenance is reduced about 80 to 90 percent. The scroll pumps do not have maintenance other than about every two to three years you will have to um, replace the tips on them. When you're looking at your um, freeze dry in your process, there's a lot of different accessories that, can, that are sample specific that can help ease your process. Um, for instance, a microplate holder. Microplates can be difficult to freeze dry. Um, you can get a slanted freeze dry holder or cart or test tube holders. Other things that are available, if you do have a minus 50 collector and all of a sudden are, are running um, colder samples, then you can um, use a secondary vacuum trap that would utilize dry ice. And when you're looking um, at your freeze dryer, some things to consider are your coil design. Are your coils exposed giving you the maximum um, trapping or vapor stream trapping ability? Or are they um, behind the chamber where they're not as efficient? What kind of controls? Controls have really changed. Now there are touchscreen controls with freeze dryers that can um, send you emails when there is an alert or they will have built-in processes to prevent your, you from accidentally ruining your vacuum pump or um, having your samples melt back, that have elaborate um, programming where you can put more steps in or pre-freeze a certain way. So there have been a lot of in, in advancements in control and the abilities of the freeze dryers. Does your freeze dryer offer vacuum control? Many times by controlling the vacuum, you can shave hours off of your process. So that is another advancement that's, that's happened recently. And um, just within the past year, there, we have the ability to now to determine endpoint very easily in a flask with an, an accessory called an endpoint detection system. It's a, an inexpensive accessory that can go on your flask because part of the, pro the problem with freeze drying and flash is you don't know when to start or when to stop. Software and programming, touch screen, um, remote accessibility and notification um, are all um, advancements that have been made in freeze drying to make the process easier. I'm going to now um, pass it over to Jenny who will um, speak about um, who will talk on um, developing a protocol and also some troubleshooting. She's an application specialist who, um, who is, has a lot of experience in freeze drying. Great. Thank Jenny, you, Kelly. Are you there? Yep, I'm here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. So Kelly covered the process of the freeze dryers as well as the equipment that's offered. We're going to discuss very quickly how to optimize your process. Um, a couple things that you want to consider when you're filling your container, if you purchase a 600 milliliter flask and you want to pre-freeze and freeze dry 600 milliliters, it's not recommended because your glassware will break as you see in the picture. What is recommended is to fill it about a third full and to slant or shell freeze as Kelly mentioned. Another uh, common way to freeze dry is to put your samples either in test tubes or vials and you need to make sure that you do have a headspace within that vial. There are different types of pumps that can be used and some people think that the bigger the pump, the better. Make sure that you're looking at the manufacturer's recommendations on the minimum requirements for the vacuum pump in order to get the, the perfect pump for what you are trying to do. When you're looking at a hybrid pump, those sometimes pull a little bit deeper so you don't need the CFM amount that, say, a standard rotary vane pump will have. So um, what you'll need to do is kind of look at what is recommended by that manufacturer. The most important step in your freeze-dry process is the way that you pre-freeze your sample. Shell freezing is the best because you're going to get a thinner sample and that way it will speed up your lyophilization process. You do want to pre-freeze to a point below your sample's eutectic temperature. Uh, it is very important that your sample is 100% 
frozen prior to putting it onto the freeze dryer. If you put a sample on the freeze dryer that is not 100% frozen, it will immediately start to melt back, and that's not a good thing for the process. The rate of pre-freezing will determine how your samples lyophilize. As Kelly mentioned, faster pre-freezing typically creates smaller ice crystals. Larger um, ice crystals are formed by a little bit slower process of freeze drying. And then you can also do the annealing process where you pre-freeze to uh, a maximum temperature and then bring it up just below the sample's eutectic temperature to prevent melt back. A lot of people think that during primary drying, especially when you have control of your product shelf temperature, that colder is better. And Kelly mentioned that you do need heat transfer to those samples in order to speed up the freezing, the freeze dry process, the lyophilizing process. What you want to do on a shelf is typically bring it about five to 10 degrees below the sample's eutectic temperature in order to get the um, optimized speed of your lyophilized process. If you look at a tray dryer or a clear chamber with shelves, you'll notice that the front product, the front vials, are going to have more radiant heat than the back vials. So that's another thing that you have to keep in consideration. If you are looking at endpoint and you notice that the front vials seem like they look like they're freeze dried, you do want to keep going a little bit longer to account for the samples that are insulated in the middle. Flasks will use room temperature as their heat transfer. There's not much you can do about that in a flask. However, you can insulate them if it seems that it's taking a long time to freeze dry, or if your samples are starting to melt back, you can also insulate them to block the UV light. The optimum conditions for your lyophilizer, and we've seen this a lot. There's been a, a couple times when I go into a lab and the lyophilizer is sitting right in front of a window and it's Florida and it's July. So you do want your room to be relatively cool, about 22 degrees Celsius. If a room is too small, it's going to get too hot in that room so your samples could melt. You don't want to be a, directly under a heat vent. Um, and you, your freezer needs to be close to your freeze dryer. You don't want to take a sample from a different building, again, in July in Florida, and walk it from one building to the other building where your freeze dryer is because those samples obviously could melt during that walk. So if your freezer is located close to your freeze dryer, it, it really is a better um, alternative. Some customers like to use a bulking agent, if you look at the outcome of some samples, you'll get different results. So the middle picture is a nice cake-like sample, but every once in a while you'll get a sample that kind of collapses and it doesn't look like a pretty cake. Bulking agents or stabilizers will help that. If you have a sample that is temperature sensitive, you can use what are called lyoprotectants and those help protect those samples. We get a question often about CGMP for lyophilizers, and I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Basically, according to the F uh, FDA, the manufacturer is really not um, in control of your specific CGMP. You can actually purchase a lyophilizer from LabConco and make it fit your CGMP requirements. That would be done on your end. But what LabConco can give you is we can give you the materials of construction, all of the test reports that have been done on your specific freeze dryer. We have the manuals, the links um, to videos, different literature specifications, three-part specs. We also offer IQOQ to be done by yourself on your freeze dryer. And if you do need PQ, we can give recommendations to outside consulting groups. So we're happy to, to give that as you, if you need it. Some things that I've seen in my 17 years at LabConco would be some challenging samples. One of those samples that we see often would be tert butyl alcohol, 
what happens is you end up with a gummy end product. You also see this with oils where you don't get a nice cake, you get more of a, a gummy product at the end that doesn't dry 100%. So just something to keep in mind. Alcohols have a very low freezing point, so they can sometimes be difficult to keep frozen. So you'll have a frozen sample, you'll put it on the freeze dryer, and it'll melt back. That's why you must dilute an alcohol sample. If you can evaporate it off prior to putting it on the lyophilizer, that's that's a good thing because then you don't have to deal with diluting. Uh, you also need a minus 105 freeze dryer in order for you to have the temperature differential. DMSO is a very common solvent that we're seeing more and more often, and it freeze dries, it freeze dries nicely, but it will attack your rubber and plastic components. Anytime you need to pull a deep vacuum, you have to have rubber components to keep that vacuum sealed. One thing to keep in mind with the MSO, as well as DMS, that's another solvent that, that will start attacking the rubber and plastic components, you just may need to replace your gaskets over time when you start seeing cracking or brittle gaskets. Sugars and salts have very low eutectic temperatures as well, so you want to look at a minus 84 freeze dryer if you are doing sugars and salts. Um, and you also want to look at a HEPA filter because, especially with sugars, they tend to, um, you get particulates in your vacuum pump and you can start to damage your pump. So a HEPA filter will protect your vacuum pump. Soil samples, um, that's another thing that could migrate into your pump. So again, you do want to look at a HEPA filter to prevent that migration into the pump. When you're looking at whole samples such as a blueberry, something with a shell or a grape, you want to either homogenize those fruits and vegetables, or if you can poke holes in that skin or peel the skin. And if you're doing animals, which is becoming more and more common again, um, again, you want to poke holes in that skin just so that that vapor can leave those animals and not get tied up with anything binding it. Couple things, a uh, couple common problems when you're looking at troubleshooting. If your samples won't stay frozen, make sure that you are using the correct freeze dryer. Um, look at the sample size. Obviously, if you have a small sample, it's gonna melt a lot quicker than a larger sample. And look at every aspect of your sample. Could it have some alcohol? Could it have solvents? Could it have salts or sugars? And then make sure that your vacuum pump is pulling at the correct depth. If samples are being sucked out of the vial by the vacuum, you can either use filter paper or parafilm, and that's gonna help keep those samples in the vial. Um, if they're taking too long to lyophilize, again, is your shelf temperature too cold, or is your sample too thick, or is there something blocking that vapor path that's not allowing the samples to, or the vapors to leave? If the pressure is not low enough, and vacuum issues are probably the most common problem that we have uh, with a lyophilizer, check everything on your unit. We have a video to vacuum troubleshoot. It's also in the manual. You can also call our product service group and they'll walk you through it. Um, or we might need to get a servicer in to determine if something internally is causing that issue. Sometimes you're gonna notice that the final product looks different from time to time, and what that, what that could be is your initial uh, solvent is colder than it was the day before or warmer than the day before. There's a lot of different things that can cause that cake to look different from time to time. Did you have too much active ingredient? Did you have too little active ingredient? Um, if you have a cake versus a powder, it could be due to the solvent that you're using or it could be due to your active ingredient that it may not form a nice cake. It could also be due to how you pre-froze those samples. So the outcome, it's very normal for you to get different outcomes even in the same batch on the same freeze dryer. Doing an oil change is very important so you don't destroy your pump. You saw in a picture a rusted rotary vane pump. That pump was destroyed in about two to three weeks. So it happens fairly quickly, which is why you need to do regular oil changes Check your sight glass, make sure your oil is clean. Um, so a few th different things to do. 
And the gas ballast helps keep those solvents clean. Um, you want to open or close it to vent out any contaminants that got into that pump. And we do recommend doing it after each run. And more of that information can be um, given either through our website or um, if you want to ask us directly, we're happy to explain how that gas ballast works so that you can extend the life of your pump. Okay, so that's all I have. And hopefully we didn't take too much of your time, but we're happy to answer questions. Thank you both for your presentations. Before we begin the question and answer session, a poll question will appear on your screen. You may select your answers and close the question by clicking on the X in the right corner. And the question is, will your laboratory be purchasing a freeze dry in the future? Also, the speakers have provided additional information for you. And so it is time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Kelly Williams and or Jenny Sprung, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. The first question is, my freeze dry sample melts within 30 minutes of being on the freeze dryer. What should I do differently? Well, as we discussed in optimizing the process, there could be a couple things that um, you want to look at. Specifically, what is your sample? Are there solvents? Are there alcohols? And then we would need to know which freeze dryer you have, because you may have the wrong freeze dryer for what you're trying to do. And our next question is, I need to stop a small number of samples under vacuum. What is the most economical way to do this? We do, we do have other accessories. We have a mini stoppering chamber or else a, 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 a stoppering chamber where you can turn the handle yourself and stopper. So um, there are um, some economical ways to do that with a freeze dryer if you cannot, can't afford to buy a, a large stoppering tray dryer. Is it possible to over dry a sample? Um, generally speaking, um, you, it, it's, it's nearly impossible. No one really has, or when you say over dry, I assume that you mean um, keep it on there too long. Um, that has never been a problem. So um, depending on your application, um, there really isn't, when you're freeze drying, you're wanting to get all the moisture out. So we haven't run across anyone that's ever over dried their sample. We've, we've seen under drying of a sample, but I've never seen over drying of a sample. Um, if you under dry a sample, it will actually start reconstituting itself. The next one is, I run a few samples a month that vary in size and can never tell when they are completely dry. Do you have any suggestions? Well, if your samples are in flask, and you're getting ready to get a new system, you could get our new end zone endpoint determination accessory that will tell you, it will actually alert when the, your sample's dry, so it makes it um, very easy to know when it is finished. If you have an older unit or you're doing trays, um, one thing that you can do is um, close the valve or isolate the tray dryer from the collector and see if the vacuum pressure changes. As long as you're undergoing um, lyophilization, you're producing vapor molecules that will affect the vacuum level. So once you close the valve, if your vacuum decreases, that will tell you that your sample is still um, being freeze dried. The next question is, do large crystals damage our samples? Um, that's, that's a great question that I should have mentioned when I was covering it earlier. For if your sample is a chemical sample, it is not going to um, damage it. However, if people are working with cells and or tissues and they're trying to freeze dry, the goal for that pre-freezing is to, use, to have it form small crystals. So you're going to want to freeze dry it fast um, so that the crystals are smaller and they, um, they are not going to be disruptive to the cell membranes or cell walls. Do you have recommendations for handling potential pathogens? Um, that is a question that we get a lot, and it's, you're going to have to involve your safety officer 
Um, there are some um, things, and it, in, it um, all is going to be dependent on your situation and the pathogen itself. However, there are HEPA filters that will go between the collector and the vacuum pump, and you're going to want to um, put a HEPA filter in line and deal with those pathogens before they reach your pump for sure. Um, a lot of people will um, put them, isolate them in a biohazard style clean room, but um, certainly addressing it as small as possible, as early in the process as possible, is um, more preferred than having a bigger issue at, by not addressing it early. Are there any available charts or tables for eutetic temperature or collapsed temperature for commonly used solvents? Yes, um, we do yes. have eutectic. Oh, sorry, Kelly. We do have a eutectic temperature chart that was in the the um, presentation. In terms of the collapsed temperature, it really depends on what you're adding to it, because obviously most people are not doing pure water to freeze dry. It's a matter of what you're adding to it. I would like to once again thank. Oh, sorry. Please answer. Oh, it, it, if you go back earlier in the slides, those eutectic charts were were included. I would like to once again thank Kelly Williams and Jenny Sprung for their presentations. Do you have any final comments for us today? No, no. we thank you um, for joining us and for the great questions. If we did not get to your question, um, go ahead and send it in and we can email you. Um, we appreciate your interest in the products. Jenny, did you have anything? No, nope, I appreciate you guys for joining us. Well, thank you both once again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, LabConco, for making today's educational webcast possible. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January 27, 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.